Ryan, Jesse Rugi, and Nick headed up the trail, with Nick still totally unaware as to what was happening. If anything, in his drunken 15-year-old mind, they were going on to do some more partying. However, once they reached the hole up ahead, Jesse pulled out the duct tape and told Nick he needed to tie his hands together. He added that he wasn't going to hurt him, and Nick nodded. But then, Jesse pulled off more duct tape and wrapped it around his head, to the point where Nick was struggling to breathe. Ryan then dragged Nick over to the hole and pushed him in. A podcast focusing on the true victims of crime. Nick Markowitz. Nicholas Samuel Markowitz was born on the 19th of September 1984 to Jeff and Susan. He was the third child in their family. Jeff had come into this relationship with Susan a few years earlier with two of his own children from a previous relationship, Leah and Ben. Susan had been welcomed into the family with joy and open arms and knew that she wanted to have a child of her own too. Susan became pregnant with Nick and gave birth when Leah was nine and Ben was six years old. Ben was thrilled to have a little brother and even though he and Leah only visited every other week, he took the role of big brother seriously. By the time Nick was three years old, Ben was keen to play the cooler, older brother. By this point, Ben and Leah were living with Jeff, Susan and Nick half of the time and back with their mother and her boyfriend the other half of the time. Ben and Leah moved schools and Ben was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder as well as Jeff's ex-wife and the mother of both Ben and Leah asking for more money for the children. Arguments began to ensue between the two families and as Susan Markowitz writes in her book My Stolen Son, Jeff's ex was quote very angry that he'd moved on so fast after they'd separated and their mother had begun asking them about their little bastard brother unquote. During this difficult time, Ben's life continued as much as possible, like any other 10-year-old. He played Little League baseball and hung out with friends on the weekends. It was a nice break away from the drama of home. Around this time, Ben met a boy called Jesse James Hollywood. His father coached the Pirates team of Little League baseball, and although Ben was a couple years older, the pair did get to know each other through the baseball games. Ben was an all-star player, so tended to know all of the boys on the teams. On Jesse's team, there were three other players who Ben knew. William Skidmore, Ryan Hoyt, and Jesse Rugi. Around this time, Ben began to act out and would have aggressive tendencies that involved throwing things across the room and being unable to control certain impulses. By the time he was 11, Ben had been caught by an off-duty police officer as he and his friend were messing around with a screwdriver going around puncturing car tyres. A little while later, Ben and a friend called round at another friend of theirs. They knocked on the door, but there was no answer, so they decided to walk inside anyway. On the coffee table, they spotted some car keys and took that as their cue to grab them and go for a joyride. Ben was only 11 years old at this point, but had been able to actually drive the car quite a distance before crashing it into three other cars. Both Susan and Jeff found out about the incident before the police were called and were just so relieved that no one had been hurt. They paid for the damages and decided they needed to take Ben to a psychiatrist who ended up prescribing him Ritalin, a drug that is often used to treat ADHD in children aged six years and over. Not long after this, Ben and his mother got into a physical fight, which ended up in him leaving the home and running away. He decided he couldn't live with his mother anymore, and Jeff and Susan took him in and began occasionally taking him to counselling, as well as keeping a tight rein on him. It wasn't long after that that Ben was initiated into his first gang, called Down to Serve. This involved a number of initiation tasks one of which included getting jumped, where one of the members broke his arm. He lied to Susan and Jeff and said that he'd fallen off of his bike, but in reality, it was the first step into a world of gang life for the 12-year-old. During this time, Ben had been amping up to steal a car, and one afternoon during that same year, 
Ben made good on his promise and used a dent puller to rip out the ignition of a car they found, and then he used a screwdriver to start it. He and a fellow new gang recruit then made their way to a party in Palm Springs, with Ben in the driver's seat. The 300-mile journey went relatively smoothly, with no car troubles or crashes, despite Ben's broken arm. But as the pair made their way back to their friend's house, Ben clocked his friend's older brother in a nearby car following him, obviously alerted to what was going on, and attempted to pull the car over and get them out. Ben and the other car became involved in a car chase, which resulted in him running a red light at 50 miles an hour and straight into another car. Incredibly, no one was injured, but this time the police had been called. They arrested both Ben and his 15-year-old friend and searched the car. In the boot, they discovered a 22 caliber rifle. Ben was taken to a juvenile detention centre for three weeks as punishment for the car theft and illegal gun possession. After that, Ben returned home and, at age 13, promised his father and Susan that he would turn his life around and would stop hanging out with the down-to-serve gang. Susan writes in her book, My Stolen Son, that she bought Ben a journal for the two of them to write notes to each other. One of the notes she shares is from Ben to her. Quote, Susan, I really like staying home, and you have been really helpful with Taekwondo and everything. Tomorrow I'm probably going to wash my Uncle Monty's RV, make some money, and have something to do. Gotta run. You're kind of great yourself. Love, Ben. And I appreciate every little thing you do for me, even though at the time I might not act like it. I won't let your dad down this time, so don't worry about it. Unquote. Some of the notes Susan includes from Ben are indicative of a young teenager who had to grow up fast. His words are mature and emotionally intelligent. Quote, Dear Susan, I feel that both you and Dad are wrong when you go looking through my stuff without telling me. I don't care if you think it's necessary or not. You should tell me or ask me if you can do it in front of me, so then I don't feel like I have to hide love letters and stuff, because that's the only thing I worry about. Nobody has come up to me and asked where are you from or are you in a gang for a real long time. In fact, I think the last time was in September. It's like, what is gang related? People dress the way they want to dress. I know what I did was wrong, but it doesn't mean I should pay for it for a while. Stop thinking and hanging on to the bad. Think about the good. Oh, and give me my candy back I had in my drawers. Love, Ben. It became apparent over the next three years, however, that Ben was still dabbling in gang life and was caught with guns multiple times and began becoming more and more angry towards his dad and the rest of his family. It wasn't long after that that Ben decided enough was enough for him and he ran away. He spent months and months sofa surfing and living with various different people he'd met during a brief stint away a year earlier. Ben got expelled from his first high school and was made to leave his continuation school too after another fight. Not long after, at the age of 16, Ben had gotten into a fight with a boy who one of his friends had said was threatening to rape her. Ben had also been holding some brass knuckles at the time and so with one punch, he had split the boy's head open. Just at that moment, a police officer had been driving past and saw the whole thing. He was booked for another incident where he'd stolen a car and now assault with a deadly weapon as brass knuckles are considered a deadly weapon. He pleaded guilty to all charges and was taken to Challenger Memorial Youth Centre to serve out his sentence. Over the next few months, Ben and Nick wrote to each other regularly. Ben felt he hadn't done his duty as a big brother and told Nick not to be rebellious like he was. Quote, Don't go haywire and get all rebellious while I'm away. Deal with it until I get home, and I promise when I do come home, I'll help you. And, if I were you, I would just do my work when I'm supposed to. But when I was your age, I wouldn't listen to anyone. But look where I am now. I guess you're going to do what you want, but think about tomorrow, not just today. 
Nick missed his brother hugely during his time away and couldn't wait for him to finish up his sentence and return home. On the 25th of May 1995, Ben did come home and the first few weeks were blissful for the family. Unfortunately though, in the long term, Ben was still getting involved with his old gang and using drugs with his then-girlfriend. By the time Nick turned 13, he looked up to his big brother more than ever before. He knew that if someone was getting picked on, he would be there to help them. Ben had always stood up for the underdogs and Nick wanted to do the same. Nick also began trying to fit in with those around him and began expressing himself in the way he dressed. Although because of the issues Susan and Jeff had previously had with Ben dressing in specific gang-related clothing, they told Nick he wasn't to wear certain things. This upset Nick because he hadn't ever done anything wrong like joining gangs. He just wanted to wear safety pins on his clothes in a kind of punk way to fit in with the older boys he hung out with. Susan, however, told him no and confiscated the pins. She also began worrying about his grades when they started to drop. He was never a bad student, but he wasn't the overachiever she expected he would be, especially with his previous achievements and general love for reading science and history books. This, along with the previous idea of what Ben had been getting up to when he was 13, made Susan decide to go through Nick's drawers and bags on a regular basis. Nick had no privacy and began to resent the fact that he wasn't allowed to walk down the street to McDonald's on his own, or go to a friend's house if his mum didn't already know the parents. The relationship between the teenager and both of his parents began to feel strained, and things were tough. But along with the difficulty in his relationships, that year also hosted Nick's Bar Mitzvah. It was an event he was very much looking forward to, and Susan and Jeff went all out for it organising dresses, suits, limos, food and flowers, all inside of a big, beautiful hall, full of the family's relatives and friends. After the ceremony, a party commenced, including a DJ and bar. This meant that Ben and his friends had been drinking, and Ben asked if he could drive Nick back to the house afterwards. Susan said no, and an argument commenced. Ben stormed off, but he did turn up at the house a little while later. He took Nick to the side and had a talk with him, brother to brother. He wanted to be there for him. Whatever Nick needed, Ben would provide. He then handed over the ring their dad had given him on his 16th birthday, and Nick promised to look after it forever. Nick continued to ask Ben if he could tag along with him when he'd go to parties or hang out at his friends' houses, It was around this time that Ben took him to a party at one of his friend's houses where there would be a lot of drugs. This house belonged to Jesse James Hollywood, named after the American outlaw and bank robber. Jesse James was the boy who played Little League Baseball with Ben years earlier, whose father had coached the Pirates team. Although in all those years, things had changed for Jesse... He was now a local drug dealer who had made thousands of dollars dealing weed under his father's watchful eye and with his help. Jesse's father was a major drug dealer and made hundreds of thousands of dollars in dealing. At just 19 years of age, Jesse James owned a three-bedroom house in West Hills and owned two expensive cars. His drug dealing afforded him a very luxurious lifestyle, He was used to living the high life and getting whatever he wanted. During this one party, Jesse James brandished around a semi-automatic pistol to show his guests, whilst Ben and Nick watched on nearby. Over the next few weeks and months, Ben and Jesse James became closer. They would spend hot summer afternoons working out in Jesse James's home gym. Ben had just turned 20 when he began dealing drugs for Jesse James. Dealing drugs wasn't a new thing for Ben, but he wasn't reliable and had run up huge debts with other drug dealers in the area, so he needed someone new to front him. Jesse James agreed to front up to $40,000 worth of drugs a time to Ben, allowing him to go on and sell the drugs for profit and then pay Jesse James back. 
With Ben now involved in weekly dealings, he soon immersed himself in the friendship group completely, regularly hanging out with Jesse James and his friends William, Ryan and Jesse Rugi. Nick, meanwhile, was growing up fast. He was 15 years old by this point, and one day, whilst he was at school, he decided to go outside and hide around a corner so that he could smoke a cigarette. He was only going to be quick, but, unfortunately for him, the vice principal had caught him. After bringing him back into the school to tell him off, he then searched Nick's pockets and found a bag that had residue of weed in it. The police were called because it was illegal at the time in California. Nick was taken to the police station, arrested, and his fingerprints were taken. One afternoon, Jesse James told Ben that he was heading to San Diego to go and collect a $2,000 drug debt. When he mentioned the name of the person that owed him the money, Ben realised he actually knew him. He said that he could come too and he'd be able to help Jesse James, quote, handle it. Jesse James agreed and the pair drove to the person's house. Once there, knowing full well there was no way the person could pay back that amount of money, Ben suggested that the guy should call up his ecstasy dealer and say he had a buyer for $2,000 worth of pills. When the dealer arrived with the pills, Jesse James and Ben grabbed the bag and took off, making it look like a robbery, while simultaneously cancelling the debt. Ben wanted to help this guy out and assured Jesse James that he would sell the pills for him and make the money back. The catch being that he'd sell each pill for double, so he would actually make around $2,000 profit for himself to keep. Jesse James told him that was fine as long as he got his money. However, after selling a few pills at a party soon after, one of the customers complained, telling Ben the pills weren't working. Ben took one himself and quickly realised they weren't ecstasy. He drove to Jesse James's house and told him he wasn't going to be selling them anymore. Jesse James refused to accept that and said Ben still owed him $2,000. He managed to raise around $800 altogether, but told Jesse James that was it. Jesse James was furious, but Ben walked out before he could say much more. The next few months consisted of a few fleeting demands from Jesse James to Ben, but generally, things had cooled down, and Ben himself had begun to work for his dad, and even had a long-term girlfriend. He and his girlfriend had been going out for a little while, when Ben decided to propose to her. She accepted, and Ben gave her an emerald and diamond ring that Susan had given him for that sole purpose. One evening, as Ben's fiancée was working at a diner, waitressing, she clocked Jesse James Hollywood and his girlfriend come in. An hour or so later, just after they'd left, her manager called her over and showed her a note they'd left, quote, take this off Ben's debt. Ben called Jesse James and after he got no answer, left a threatening voicemail on his machine. How dare he disrespect Ben like that? And by involving his fiancée, he had just started a war. Ben decided to start by getting Jesse James back straight away. He called an insurance company Jesse had his car insured with and alerted them to the fact that although Jesse had claimed his car had been stolen and he needed $35,000 insurance payout, Jesse had in fact sold the expensive bits of the car and destroyed the rest. The insurance company immediately cancelled his claim and he lost any chance of collecting the money. The next few months were full on from both Ben and Jesse James, attempting to intimidate each other and scare the other. This resulted in Ben moving apartments and buying a gun, as well as Jesse James believing that Ben had poisoned one of his pit bulls. One incident involved Ben and his friend going round to Jesse's house and smashing a number of his windows using a steel pipe. One weekend in August 2000, Nick brought a few friends round to his house so they could all play pool. Nick's dad made them all food and then after a few hours they all left to go and hang out elsewhere. One of the friends was someone both Jeff and Susan didn't know. Later that evening, Nick's sister Leah 
her husband Ian and their daughter had come round to see the family and were waiting for Nick to come back. He loved seeing his niece and the family knew he'd be back in an hour or so as that was his curfew time. Susan was surprised when she heard her son come through the door around an hour before she expected him. She assumed he was just excited to see his niece, but as he made his way quickly past the family gatherings and down the stairs, Susan stopped him and told him to come say hi. That's when she noticed his eyes. He was stoned. Susan demanded to know what he'd been doing, but Nick refused to answer and instead turned back around and fled out of the house. Susan tried to follow him but knew he'd outrun her easily. She knew he'd return later. He'd probably come back with his tail between his legs and they would address the issue in the morning when he was sober. Sure enough, Nick returned home before his curfew but told his mum, quote, I just don't like it when you bug me about having cigarettes. She knew it wasn't just cigarettes he'd been smoking but she and Jeff decided to go to bed early and they could talk about it in the morning like they discussed. The next morning, Susan woke Nick up and told him she'd make him breakfast downstairs. She went into the kitchen and made a Sunday morning omelette with bacon and hash browns and told Jeff to go and tell Nick his breakfast was ready. Jeff knocked on Nick's door, but there was no answer. He'd probably just fallen back to sleep. He knocked again, a little louder this time. But when there was no answer, he opened the door a little. It was this moment that he realised Nick wasn't there. He clearly hadn't wanted to talk about last night and had taken off after his mother had woken him up. When Nick had run away before, or gone out without telling his parents, they knew that he would most likely be hanging out with his older brother. This wasn't something they particularly liked, because they knew the kind of influence Ben could have on Nick, and it wasn't always positive. Jeff called Ben and left a message on his answering machine, asking to call them back as soon as he heard from Nick. But by that evening, with no returned call from Ben and no answer when they tried him, Susan and Jeff began to worry. They called all of his friend's parents, but no one could help. And by this point, alarm bells were ringing for the rest of the family. Nick had been seen by his uncle and cousin earlier that morning, likely just after he'd left his house. They'd been driving back from the gym and passed him walking down the street. They pulled up and asked if he needed a ride anywhere, but he said no thanks, he'd rather walk. After that, no one that Susan or Jeff spoke to had seen Nick. They just hoped that he and Ben were too preoccupied somewhere and he'd come bounding through the door at any moment totally unaware of all the worry he'd caused. Meanwhile, across town earlier on that same morning, Jesse James had called up his friends, William and Jesse Rugi, and told them to get ready. They were taking a trip to a party in Santa Barbara. Jesse Rugi was 20 years old, with a criminal record and a small amount of prison time under his belt. Before they left for Santa Barbara, however, They had decided to drive towards Ben's family home and were in the process of deciding what exactly they were going to do to send a message to Ben. However, before they made it to the house, one of the three in the van spotted a teenage boy walking the opposite way down the street. They quickly realised it was Nick, Ben's brother, and pulled the van over. Before Nick realised what was happening... Jesse James had jumped out of the van and had pinned him up against a tree. He screamed at Nick, demanding to know where Ben was, but Nick swore he didn't know. This infuriated Jesse James and he began hitting Nick. Jesse Rugi and William joined soon after and the three of them continued to beat Nick up. Just a few minutes later, William forced Nick into the van and Jesse Rugi jumped in the front and they sped off. It was only once they were partway down the street that they realised in their haste they had left Jesse James Hollywood on the side of the road. They quickly drove back and got him, but in the meantime, a family had been on their way back from church when they had seen the van pull over and three men jump Nick and then force him into the van. The mother of the family didn't have a mobile phone at the time, 
but told her sons to help her memorise the number plate and then she drove straight home to call 911. She reported the incident at the same time as another woman, a UCLA student, also witnessed the kidnapping and called 911. Unfortunately, even with the quick response from the two witnesses, both incidents were recorded incorrectly and nothing was taken any further. Meanwhile, in the van, Jesse James was demanding to know where Ben was, but Nick insisted he didn't know. At the same time, Nick's pager was going off continuously, and when Jesse James asked if it was Ben, Nick checked and told him it wasn't. It was his mum. The van drove on and ended up picking up another friend, Brian, and then headed onwards. Jesse Rugi asked what they were going to do with Nick, to which Jesse James responded he didn't know, but for now, they should take him to one of their other friends' houses. The group arrived to an apartment in Santa Barbara and were invited in. Once inside, the group forced Nick into the corner of one of the smaller back bedrooms and duct-tied his hands and legs, blindfolded him with a sock and gagged him with another sock. The friend who had let the group into his apartment stumbled across what was happening, but before he could say anything, Jesse James told him to keep his mouth shut. Quote, you don't say shit. Jesse James added that they would be gone soon. They were just waiting until they could track down Ben. Jesse James told Brian and William they could leave, and he actually then allowed Nick to be untied, and the three of them started playing video games. Jesse James then left for the night, and Jesse Rugi took Nick to his father's house and kept watch over him there, while he waited for the next instructions from Jesse James. Whilst there, Jesse Rugi's dad just assumed Nick was a friend, as he wasn't tied up, and didn't seem to be in any kind of distress at this point. Jesse Rugi told Nick that this would all be over soon. Jesse James was just freaking out. He'd make sure Nick got home safely after all of this was over. At this point, Jesse James was actually beginning to worry. He'd seen Nick on the side of the road and decided quite spur of the moment to beat him up and then kidnap him. And now with Jesse Rugi still holding Nick for him, he didn't know what he should do next. He decided to call his lawyer to explain the situation and ask what would happen if he was found out. The lawyer told him that sentence for kidnapping was eight years and if there was any kind of ransom demand, that sentence could go up to life. The next morning, Jesse, Rugi and Nick sat on the sofa and played more video games until a little later. A few friends turned up and got ready for a day of partying with drinks and drugs. Nick was introduced as a friend of Jesse's to 17-year-old Graham Presley, 16-year-old Kelly and 17-year-old Natasha. Nick and Graham then continued playing video games for the next hour or so, whilst the girls stayed inside chatting. After that, Jesse Rugi went outside and he ordered the other friends remaining inside not to let Nick use the phone which they all found a little odd given at this point they had thought he was just a friend. They were soon told by Nick what had actually happened, but he said he didn't mind and he was sure things would be sorted soon. Over the next few hours, Jesse Rugi actually left and went for lunch with Jesse James whilst Nick was kept inside with the other two teenage girls and Graham. The girls helped clean up his wounds from the ambush the day before, and one even asked why he didn't just leave. But again, Nick said he didn't mind. He wanted to do whatever he could to help his brother, even if it meant staying here for a bit longer. Later that afternoon, Jesse Rugi, Jesse James and his girlfriend returned. Things seemed fine. Jesse James wasn't beating anyone up. Nick was no longer tied up, and there were three more people who knew about what was going on. The next day, however... Back at Jesse Rugi's house, Natasha asked what was going to happen to Nick. She knew that Jesse James Hollywood was capable of bad things, and she knew the kind of friends he kept. She turned to Graham and asked him outright what had been said. Graham told her that Jesse James had offered his friend Jesse Rugi $2,000 to kill Nick, but that obviously Jesse Rugi had refused. This news obviously terrified Natasha. Up to this point, She thought things were much less serious than they actually were. 
she was beginning to panic and started to cry. And when Jesse Rugi asked what was wrong, she told him, quote, you have to promise me you're not going to kill him. Jesse Rugi told her he promised he wouldn't hurt him. He then went outside and showed Natasha he was serious. He looked Nick in the eye and told him they'd get him home. They'd take him to a bus station, put him on a greyhound and get him home. Before they did that though, Jesse Rugi said they should all go and get a hotel room and party. Graham called his mother to come and give them a lift and she picked them up a little while later. Nick thanked her for the ride and they all booked into room 341 at the Lemon Tree Inn in Santa Barbara. The group smoked and drank and at some point decided to go and hang out in the hotel's outdoor hot tub. Whilst there, Nick and Graham used some techniques the girls had taught them the previous day on picking up girls. None of them worked, but the two boys found it funny and agreed to continue trying another time. They spent the next few hours talking about music and life, and Nick confided that there was a girl back home he liked and he wanted to ask her out. He'd never had the courage before, but after this weekend, he felt a new kind of drive. He was going to call her as soon as he was home. At around 11pm that evening, The girls said goodbye and left, but not before giving Nick their phone numbers and telling him to keep in touch. Then, as Graham was about to leave, Jesse Rugi stopped him and asked him to stay. Graham sat on the sofa and turned on the TV, whilst Nick fell asleep on the other sofa. He had been drinking a lot and was a little out of it. A few moments later, there was a knock at the door. It was Ryan Hoyt, Jesse James's friend and number two. Ryan was one of Jesse James's childhood friends, and he tended to hang around with the two Jessies and William, regularly dealing drugs for them. Ryan was extremely close to the entire Hollywood family, and often went on holiday with Jesse and his parents. Jesse did, however, take advantage of this relationship, and in exchange for the time they spent together, as well as gifts and fronting drugs, Jesse demanded whatever he wanted from Ryan. Things like cleaning painting, collecting his little brother from school and any other general chores were standard for Ryan. Even though Ryan worked part-time elsewhere, he was only doing that to pay off some of the debts he owed Jesse. He owed him some money, but Jesse had also added on high interest rates on top. Ryan owed Jesse a lot, monetary-wise, and everything else he felt Jesse had done for him over the years. Ryan arrived and immediately headed for the bathroom. After a couple of minutes, he headed back out and summoned Jesse Rugi over. He asked where Jesse James was, but Jesse Rugi said he wasn't expecting him to come tonight because it was his girlfriend's birthday. The pair then left and returned a few hours later. Jesse Rugi headed back inside the hotel room and sent Graham out to leave with Ryan. Graham and Ryan had never met before that evening, but Jesse Rugi told Graham he needed to help Ryan with something. The pair arrived back at the hotel room a little while later, and Ryan told Nick they were going to take him to the car. The four of them drove to the same spot in the mountains around half an hour away. As they bundled out of the car, Ryan directed Nick on which way to walk, and as he did so, Graham stopped. He knew what this meant, and he couldn't bring himself to partake in anything further than this. He turned back around and got into the car and waited. Ryan, Jesse Rugi, and Nick headed up the trail, with Nick still totally unaware as to what was happening. If anything, in his drunk 15-year-old mind, they were going on to do some more partying. However, once they reached the hole up ahead, Jesse pulled out the duct tape and told Nick he needed to tie his hands together. He added that he wasn't going to hurt him, and Nick nodded. But then... Jesse pulled off more duct tape and wrapped it around his head, to the point where Nick was struggling to breathe. Ryan then dragged Nick over to the hole and pushed him in. Just seconds later, Ryan fired nine bullets. Each of them hit Nick fatally and he died instantly. Ryan then wiped off the gun and threw it into the hole alongside Nick, 
He and Jesse Rugi then covered Nick's body with sand and leaves before returning to the car. The three of them then drove back to the Lemon Tree Inn and concocted a story. Graham would stay at the hotel that night and check out in the morning. Ryan made it clear to him that if he told anyone, he would be killed too. Then Jesse Rugi and Ryan left and told Graham if anyone asked, Jesse James had threatened Nick not to tell anyone and then just let him go. What had actually happened to Nick that night would remain a secret between the three men for less than a few hours. Ryan called Jesse James and told him it was done. He didn't owe him money anymore and he seemed to be pretty proud of his work, the first person he'd killed. He told Jesse James the details of what had actually happened that night. When Ryan and Jesse Rugi had left the hotel room a few hours before Nick's murder, they had gone back to Jesse Rugi's father's house and taken a couple of shovels as well as a roll of duct tape. They then made their way back to the hotel to pick up Graham. He knew the area well and he could help them find a good spot to dig a grave. Because Graham didn't really know what was going on, nor did he know Ryan, when he was ordered to get into the car and then up a hiking trail nearby... He panicked because he was told to dig a hole and assumed he was going to be silenced for knowing too much about the kidnapping. He thought he was digging his own grave. However, once the hole was dug, Ryan ordered Graham back to the car and they drove the few miles back to the Lemon Tree Inn. The next few days were agony for Susan and Jeff, who had opened the door soon after Nick's disappearance to find Ben stood there looking puzzled. He'd got their message, but Nick wasn't with him. Ben had been away on a construction job, so hadn't been in touch with anyone, including Nick. Everyone was worried. Up until that point, they at least had the possibility that Nick would be hiding out with his older brother, but now that Ben was here, they all knew something was seriously wrong. Between Susan, Jeff and a few family friends and Ben they started making phone calls to see if there was anyone they'd missed that might have seen him. Ben even called Jesse James. He mentioned the fact that they weren't on good terms but said he really needed his help. Little Nick was missing and he just needed to know if he'd seen him around. A few days later, on a warm Saturday in August 2000, Darla Gasek, a 27-year-old woman, and her two friends had decided to hike up towards Lizard's Mouth, a mountaintop rock formation that overlooks Santa Barbara. The wind-carved pockets on the underside of the sandstone make the rock look like a lizard's mouth. The hike to Lizard's Mouth is quite short, so attracts lots of tourists and hikers because it offers some incredible views. Dala and her two friends made their way up a sandy dirt hill, and as they got closer to the top, began to notice a low, buzzing sound. They soon realised it was a huge horde of flies, all swarming around a very specific area in the sand. Between the three of them, they gathered round the mound of sand and one of the friends used their foot to move some of the sand, and it was there that they made the chilling discovery. The leg of a blue pair of jeans stuck out from the sand, and as they drew closer... The unmistakable stench of death met them. Nick's body had reached an advanced state of decomposition due to the heat. His hands and face were bloated and larvae had burrowed into his nose and mouth. Nick's body was removed and taken back to the coroner's office for official identification. The medical examiner did manage to gain Nick's fingerprints despite the advanced level of decomposition and uploaded them to the system to see if they had a match. Due to the earlier arrest Nick had for possession of weed at his high school, he was quickly identified as the victim. Officers investigating the murder began to question everyone associated with Nick at the time. This included Ben, who told them everything he could about his drug dealing history and past with various gangs. He was asked specifically what guns Jesse James Hollywood owned, and when Ben said a TEC-9, the officers knew who had been responsible for Nick's murder. What they couldn't have known at this point was who else had been involved or the series of events that had taken place on those few days. 
It wasn't long before investigators had a list of all the people involved from various witness statements and began their task of arresting them. Graham told his parents what had happened and asked them to drive him to the police station so that he could be arrested. Jesse Rugi, William and Ryan were all arrested at their respective houses with the help of detectives and a SWAT team. Investigators, however, failed to find Jesse James Hollywood. His father told officers he didn't know where his son was and his friends hadn't seen him, but officers suspected he was on the run and his father was probably helping him. In August of 2002, an episode of Unsolved Mysteries aired showing Nick's story. Jesse was also profiled on America's Most Wanted and the case was documented on Dateline. Meanwhile, the trials commenced for the other perpetrators. Graham Presley, who dug the grave without knowledge of what it was actually for, was convicted as a juvenile. Graham was released from the California Youth Authority facility in 2007 after serving five years for second-degree murder. William Skidmore, who was 20 years old at his point of arrest, pleaded guilty to kidnapping and robbery and was sentenced to nine years in prison. Jesse Rugi, who was also 20, was convicted of kidnapping and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Ryan Hoyt was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. During this time, Jesse James Hollywood had not been captured by police, and Jeff, Susan and Ben were struggling to come to terms with the fact that it could be a long time before they got justice for their Nick. Meanwhile, detectives were still working to track Jesse down themselves. They tapped his father's phone and discovered a lot of drug deals, but decided not to arrest him too early. They knew if they waited it out, they'd have a much better chance of him leading them straight to Jesse James. In March of 2005, investigators noticed a new phone number appearing on the dad's phone bill. That person had recently applied for a visa and was heading to Brazil. Another tip alerted them to the fact that Jesse James was due to meet a cousin at a mall near a beach where he was at in the Brazilian resort of Saquarima. Officers intercepted and arrested Jesse James Hollywood on the spot. The very next day, Jesse James was handcuffed and sent on a plane back to California. In July of 2009, Jesse James Hollywood was convicted of Nick's murder and was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. William Skidmore was released after serving nine years in prison for kidnapping and robbery. Jesse Rugi was paroled in 2013 after serving 13 years of his life sentence in Pleasant Valley State Prison for aggravated kidnapping with special circumstances. Susan's book, My Stolen Son, goes into detail about how she, Jeff and Ben coped with the following weeks and months. Ben spiralled into a life of harder drugs and crime and Susan drank and became heavily depressed often contemplating and sometimes attempting to die by suicide. Years later, and Ben has turned his life around with a family of his own. His father, Jeff, said, quote, The irony is that his little brother saved him. Nick saved Ben. In a CBS interview with Barry Leibowitz, Susan Markowitz talks of her stepson, Ben. Quote, ben is now a father of three and I wish him nothing but peace and positive energy. We both will continue to struggle with his connection in this tragedy for the rest of our lives. Ben will live with his thoughts, wishes, and what-ifs forever. But I know that he loved his brother and would have traded places with Nick had he known what was going down. 